lecture series here at the VNYI number five. Uh, this is the second in our series, um, which is now called the Distinguished Lecture Series. Um, so you could apply that retroactively to our previous speakers. Um, and today we have Tanya Petrovich, um, who for many of you needs no introduction if you've been with us before, because Tanya taught with us um, in St. Petersburg three times in 2016, 2017, and 2018. Interesting different courses. Uh, I think the first was on political humor. And I think the third one was about masculinity and was related to the topic she's gonna to talk about today. Um, and I don't remember what the other one was. Um, and also several times in the uh, virtual school as well. So usually she's a full-time faculty with us, um, but um, this time he is giving us a, this special lecture. She is um, at the Institute of Culture and Memory Studies in uh, Ljubljana at the Slovenian Academy of Sciences and Art. Um, and she has written extensively about um, post-Yugoslav culture and society in cultural linguistic aspects, political aspects. Um, she has multiple publications in that area and she's working on a new book that's coming out, I gather sometime <laughs> soon-ish with Duke University Press, that's great. Um, and is, is, and this, today's talk is, is um, part of that larger project. So we'll hear about it from the talk. Um, so she's gonna tell us today about um, feelings in forms, socialist military service and utopian imagination after Yugoslavia. So please welcome Tanya Petrovich. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. And uh, it's so nice being here uh, in a slightly different role than usual. I really like teaching and when NYI. This time I said I can't because I really need to submit this book, but of course it's a great opportunity to talk about it right now. And I was, while we were waiting for everyone to join, I was uh, scrolling through the screens to see who, um, who you people are. And of course I recognize many familiar faces and names from very different places, but also from my previous courses. And uh, of course, I was I spoke about Yugoslav army already and when NYI, and uh, that's why I today want to, to focus on something which I somehow think is more uh, generally relevant and more maybe epistemologically uh, important, uh, I would say. And it's about forms in relation to socialism generally and how we think about the meanings and um, relevance of forms uh, in relation to what we know about socialism and also about its end. And I will start maybe with, I will start also sharing my screen right now. Let me see. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I will start with the truism that we are living in not only strange times, but also times in which future is not easily imaginable. And if we imagine it, it will come more in dystopian than utopian uh, registers. It's not easy to think about the future in bright ways. Uh, it was much easier maybe during the second half of the 20th century around the globe, despite the fact that the world was uh, divided and under pretty palpable threat of, um, you know, all sorts of things, including um, nuclear disaster or nuclear war. And it's not surprising then we are also living in a time when memory and remembering and archives became keywords uh, on uh, many fields, including cultural studies, history, anthropology, history of art, and all other uh, kind of immediate, uh, intermediate disciplines between these fields. And it's no difference when we speak about Yugoslavia, of course, uh, and there is an increasing now 30 years after Yugoslavia has gone and Yugoslav socialist uh, project spectacularly failed. Uh, 
uh, and also tragically failed. There are many initiatives, many ways people try to think about the archives that project left and what they can tell us and how they can serve us for the future, for our imagination of the future and also attempts to make it uh, this future uh, better, more, um, more acceptable uh, than what is generally uh, offered through the narratives of no alternative that neoliberal capitalism actually imposes of, uh, us, on us uh, regardless of way, where we currently um, live. And uh, several fields are very uh, important sources for thinking about the archives for the future uh, when we think about the experience of Yugoslav socialism. One is definitely anti-fascist struggle in the Second uh, World War and the legacy of the National Liberation Movement and the Liberation Army uh, of, uh, of that period. Uh, then the anti-fascist front of women and the role of women in the liberation struggle. Then Yugoslav socialist concepts, ideas, and political projects of self-management, non-aligned movement, amateurism, uh, stories about socialist companies, uh, socialist industry, architecture, and so on. Just to not to stay, stay on a very um, abstract level, I just uh, want to mention that, for instance, in the last year's Venice Architectural Biennale, among former Yugoslav uh, national participants, uh, there were actually three that explicitly dealt with these legacies of Yugoslav uh, socialism in different ways. The title, overall title of the Biennale was How We we'll Live, to How Will We Live Together? And Slovenia uh, presented the project on common and community, uh, the common in community, 70 years of cooperative center, centers in a, as a social infrastructure. It was a project about cultural centers, especially in villages where many cultural activities were happening. Uh, and many of these places were abandoned or, or repurposed, but there are also a lot of um, uh, like, effort to re-establish some of them. Serbia had an uh, exhibition about uh, the town of Bor, the iconic um, industrial uh, town in Eastern uh, Serbia, uh, known uh, for uh, its, um, there, there is a, a copper mines and also a big a plant uh, for um, like um, processing copper. Uh, the, that these plants and factories and mice were uh, predictably privatized and now they are own, uh, owned by Chinese companies. And there is a struggle, ambiguous one, because of course, uh, pollution is one of the very critical issues there. But on the other hand, people are kind of, uh, you know, happier having a polluted air to bread, but also money to survive uh, then. And the third project was about uh, Montenegrin socialist female archi architect Svetlana Kana Radevic, who was uh, very important for, for building many modernist uh, projects, uh, not only in Montenegro, but throughout Yugoslavia. So these are actually, and there are many other uh, projects that somehow uh, go back um, to achievements of Yugoslav socialism, be it in architecture, education, uh, art, or any other, other field. But of course, um, a legacy of uh, an institution that was called Yugoslav People's Army, Yugoslavska Narodna Armia, and existed from the end of the Second World War, it was, trans uh, it was established when the, um, um, this National Liberation Army was transformed into a regular army and it dissolved together with the country during the wars in 1991. The legacy of this army would not be a usual suspect for uh, thinking about the archives of the future. Whatever the archives of this institution are, 
they won't find uh, themselves uh, on the list of people who try to go back to the Yugoslav experience and think how we can use that for the future. And what I'm doing here is somehow revisiting this, this particular archive, this particular institution, and particularly the forms uh, uh, through which it existed and the forms through which it somehow lives its own uh, afterlife uh, and the meanings that after, afterlife uh, has. I will uh, just make a very short, um, short um, kind of um, footnote here, maybe telling you that I started with, with this project a really long time ago. And my reason for do that was simply the fact that I understood, I could realize from my daily experience that after all these years, uh, despite of the, of course, mandatory, rather oppressive total nature of the, of the military service in socialist Yugoslavia, uh, and despite everything that happened, the fact that uh, these men who served in the Yugoslav army basically were killing each other, were involved in ethnic conflicts in the 90s. Uh, and despite great differences be, uh, among them, uh, be, it, be it in education, uh, ethnicity, social st status, be it in the ways they went through the traumatic 90s, great majority of these men see still see this experience of serving in the Yugoslav army as a meaningful experience. I'm not saying that they would go back there. I'm not saying that they think, uh, or all of them think that uh, mandatory mil military service is something that should be reintroduced, but in their own experience, they insist on meaningfulness, sometimes not explicitly, but through registers of hesitation, silence, um, um, you know, very often they think about their friends who they, whom they met in the army, but don't dare to uh, try to con contact them because they don't know what happened uh, with them with, uh, along these decades of rapture and tragedies and violence and conflict. But somehow there is this insistence of meaningfulness for so many so different men, and that was something that really caught my attention and something I wanted to explore more. Uh, but let's go back to the forms. And one of the reasons why I said that Yugoslav People's Army would not be on the list of activists, historians, anthropologists, artists who uh, turn back to Yugoslav experience uh, for uh, ideas of how to imagine or, or build uh, foundations for the future is basically, that's very, very uh, essentially related um, to form. And the Yugoslav military service was um, mandatory. It was experience uh, that was uh, isolated. The institution was very conservative, very uh, detached from the ordinary life. It was very different from, from, for instance, Israeli army that is also mandatory and universal, where uh, somehow there is a huge intertwining between military life and everyday life. For Yugoslav army soldiers, for these young men who had to go and serve for one year or some periods for even more, um, it was very far away and pretty unrelatable to their everyday life. There was a huge cut between their normal life and that experience. And there, that was also a locus of critique. Many people articulated also even during, during Yugoslav socialism towards the end of it, and especially after that, that Yugoslav People's Army was kind of um, an institution that, that embodied everything what, which, what was bad uh, with Yugoslav socialism and why that system was doomed to failure, basically. Uh, and you, you can hear, you can read here um, a quotation from 90, no, from 1988 um, um, paper by Marko Milivojevic, who was somewhere in the UK in that moment and wrote about this huge discrepancy and um, opposition between the National Liberation Army during the Second World War 
which is always imagined as uh, you know self-organized, spontaneous, non-hierarchical, um, something uh, sublime uh, in a way. And the Yugoslav army after the war, when it became a regular army, and became uh, very uh, you know um, conservative, uh, stale, um, ritualized very far away from normal life and its citizens in a way. So that's a pretty present narrative. Uh, and one of the reasons why also uh, Yugoslav people army was uh, detached from everybody, send recruits as far away from their home as possible and mix them totally. So the units of the, in which Yugoslav young men served in the army were really mixed in all possible ways. So university graduates would serve together with, you know, farmers and illiterate shepherds, Slovenians, Macedonians, Albanians, Serbs, they would all serve together. Young men who would came from abroad because their parents worked as gastarbeiters in Germany, France, or other Western European countries. All these young men will, be together, uh, would be together for a year or even more in a very intimate, close contact. And most of these, these men would actually never meet each other would they, uh, uh, would they, if they would stay in their, their natural habitat, defined by their class, their economic status, uh, their ethnicity, the, the place they lived, and so on. So this kind of uh, isolation and detachment from everyday life had also a very political reason. The army really wanted to make uh, an essential Yugoslav experience that was difficultly made in other, other way in other places. It was something that was present as an ideology, as something repeated all the time, but real experience would remain basically bound to localities people lived and to social world, worlds they belonged to. The army was in a way a different, uh, different ex uh, experience in, in that sense. Uh, so uh, this critique had to do with that and somehow overlook this very Yugoslav uh, project army wanted to um, fulfill mixing these men and all is isolating them um, during their service. But also this kind of um, you know, romanticization of the Second World War, partisan army has its limits. And we can uh, easily understand it if we just uh, take a look into notes made by uh, Konstantin Kocha Popovic, famous um, commander of the partisan army and also um, rather famous uh, Yugoslav Serbian surrealist um, he was a writer uh, coming from a rich Belgrade family. He studied in Switzerland, France, uh, philosophy and law was part of surrealist circles in the 20s and the 30s in both Serbia and France. And from there, he, uh, he first um, joined uh, Republican units in, um, in the Spanish war and then joined partisan units in Yugoslavia. 41. And he became uh, a chief commander of this legendary first proletarian brigade that was um, that was formed in December of 41. Uh, uh, one of the most important military formations of this liberation army. Surrealist, an artist, uh, very prone to experimentation, to uh, organic, um, non-constrained forms of life and thinking, but he was also a military, military commander. And here you can see he was uh, extensively writing notes. Uh, basically, after all, all major battles, he uh, participated during the Second World War. And most of these notes are still, um, like they are preserved in the archive, historical archive of, of Belgrade in Serbia. Very bad handwriting, very difficult to, to read, but still uh, here you can see what he has to say about this um, kind of relevance of strict 
and firm structures in the army. He basically complains all the time that these partisans are disorganized, everything is so spontaneous and that's bad. And uh, actually he, he articulates here uh, thoughts which was, were very present and very important for the regular army, Yugoslav people's army during socialism when, when uh, the army service was not related to war uh, at all. That army was really framed as an army of peace for most of the time. There was this idea that there were too many victims and the whole generation sac sacrificed their lives and everything during the Second World War. So these young men who went to serve uh, their mandatory service they never really thought that they would be exposed to any conflict. Uh, of course, paradoxically, that's exactly what happened in the 90s, but uh, the, the enemy was not from the outside as, as it is usually participated for uh, by big military institutions. So he speaks here about lining up, roll call every morning, constant exercises, training, strictly scheduled watch shift, familiarizing with weapons and practicing their use, collective and mandatory morning hygiene. So this was something very important uh, for him and he see, saw all of this as a prerequisite to um, be able at the first place to uh, efficiently act for, for, the partisan, for the partisan units. So there, there was obviously uh, something that is usually um, uh, overlooked in this today's rather, uh, rather romanticized ideas about Second World War is something that was sublime and ideal and self-organized. There was a lot of organizational effort that was invested and had to be invested for this army to essentially win the war. Uh, but if we leave uh, the realm of the military for a moment, we can see that forms are also so important for socialism itself. When we think about socialism very often, um, there is this, this story uh, about um, the gap between the real life or the essence or the content and form. And this is something that resonates as something very familiar because we have already very important uh, work done is in this field, which actually treats especially late socialism. So the period between the 60s and the 80s as the time in which there was, the, there was a gap between ideology and reality, especially as that reality grew progressively consumerist and lifestyle oriented as Anna Krublova was, was writing and in Yugoslavia, uh, the idea about uh, these uh, repetitive, ritualized, uh, performative, empty, void of content forms is very important for uh, the interpretation of genealogy and evolution of Yugoslav state socialism and its uh, demise for that matter as well. And uh, one of the Branislav Dimitrievich, an art historian, writes that in Yugoslavia, the utopian imagination characteristic of early period of socialist production became ideologically ritualized, creatively stale, and this ritualization and performativity eventually led to ex uh, exhaustion of socialist project. So the story goes like that, that there was something essential, sublime in the beginning, something authentic and with the passage of time, this and, and, uh, authenticity was replaced by something uh, staged, performed, um, away from reality, something that, um, uh, yes, I, uh, I uh, switched off the presentation for a while because I want to see you as well. I don't like talking to my own PowerPoint all the time, but I will bring it back at some point. But thanks for um, warning me. Uh, so that's generally the interpretative framework uh, about state socialism and its end. 
You probably know about Alexei Yurchak's book with the title, Everything Was Forever Until It Was No More, where he, that's really a seminal work in, in the field of socialist and post-socialist studies. And Yurchak there actually tries to understand together, like, and to, to explain uh, how it was possible that socialism was lived in a way everything thought it will last forever, and then no one was really surprised uh, when it uh, imploded so uh, you know spectacularly in in the late eighties and early nineties. And uh, explanation again has to do with the form, with the fact that there was a bigger and bigger, larger and larger gap between the reality and the form, and at some point. Uh, it all made no sense, more or less. So um, it does not mean, of course, that this was a very simple relationship between citizens and uh, state uh, and the forms that state insisted on and the way citizens reacted to these forms. And uh, let me go back. Mm -hmm. Uh, of course, the citizens would appropriate these forms, use them for their own uh, needs, um, change their meanings to reflect more accurately their desires, worldviews, um, and so on. So uh, there was an important and huge uh, potential in this form that was also um, pretty much used. And uh, Theorizing socialism and post-socialism, we often speak about um, different labels uh, we use to, to designate the, these uh, strategies citizens uh, appropriated at some point dealing with the forms um, imposed in a way uh, by the authoritative state. It's an Im imitative exaggeration that, we, that citizens were actually uh, over identifying with uh, uh, the forms, appropriating them uh, to even um, bigger extent than expected from them. And that, of course, uh, caused a lot of interpretational uncertainty because it was then impossible to say whether they think it seriously or fake or just make jokes or what they do is um, a combination of all of this. The similar term is imitative exaggeration, subversive affirmation, stiob, uh, which is something uh, that became widely used after your Chuck's book. And Alf Lutzke's concept of eigensinn also actually addresses very related, uh, related phenomenon. And all, all these concepts actually um, speaks uh, speak about the way citizens engage engage with the forms through which authoritative state um, and its representatives uh, structure a reality and govern it and to be sure we also know that's nothing very particular of socialism itself and that we have uh, very similar phenomena in late capitalism to um, and uh, you can uh, refer to uh, Dominique Boyer and Alexei Urchak uh, article about American job, uh, where actually they show how um, basically the same, uh, same mechanisms are used um, in the US political discourses and media discourses as well. And we can find it in all other uh, political concepts, be it post-colonial, post-socialist or, or any other. Uh, so, um, Yurchak, uh, in his really very nuanced analysis, says that the ca capacity of this form, they have a capacity to produce uh, meanings, and uh, very often these meanings have nothing to do with what was first meant when some form was introduced. Uh, and uh, also, uh, most of the people who de dealt with these socialist forms and their life also warned that we should not uh, reduce our views to just, that was not true that uh, citizens were simply just cynical or ironic or distance 
that was a much much more more complex uh, uh, relationship, uh, which uh, also included a creative interpretation and artistic execution. So there was a potential of these forms to be creative and to produce something outside given frames. Uh, and of course, the question that uh, somehow remains here is how these forms then really relate to life. Okay, we have these forms and, and citizens sometimes use them, but somehow there is this presumption that life is something else. Life is something else, authentic, and these forms are something which is not authentic. Right. Uh, and Anna Kruglova warns, uh, and that is very much to the point and something I'm very much uh, supporting in my work, uh, work that it's, there is a, a trap that we uncritically um, somehow um, accept the idea that uh, social and cultural aspects of uh, life, especially when we speak about socialism, are separate actually from life. That also, of course, is true about political aspects of life. Uh, and um, they are, of course, not, and Yurchak gives his own ex examples about it. Uh, he speaks about parades, May parade and November parade in the USSR. Uh, where people would, would go out, um, march together, carry uh, some basically same portraits and slogans, shout hooray in response to the same appeals blaring from loudspeakers and publicly display the same celebratory mood. So they would actually appropriate the forms uh, these parades were offering, but then they will, will also send greeting cards with good wishes on occasion of these national holidays, pictures on the postcards contain Soviet symbols, uh, and uh, people would typically write some formula that are kind of again from the repertoire or, or of predictable formulaic language. So, so these forms are were actually part of life and could be, but of course parades are temporary. Uh, were places and times when temporary collectivities were framed. And my question here, and that with that question, I'm going back more essentially to the Yugoslav army service is what happens when these temporalities are much longer. Yugoslav army service and army service in general uh, lasted for at least for a year, sometimes for, for longer time. So. It was made, it, const, it was constituted by, by these uh, scars, ritualized, repetitive forms. Um, but it lasted long enough that actually this became life. This became life with no other, you know, uh, no other life to be taken as authentic and this one uh, to be taken as not authentic. So that was an authentic life, life production, productive also of meaningful, meaningful uh, relations. I'm, I don't have time to really um, get you more familiar with all the peculiarities of, of Yugoslav army service and forms used there, but I think you can imagine that there were uniforms, haircuts, all men were made the same. They would endlessly repeat the same routines uh, they would be uh, told to use weapons. weapons. They, they would internalize all of this, repeating all of this so many times. Many people say that they would, even after they would go back, they would uh, dream night after night how they assemble and um, uh, disassemble um, this half automatic or automatic uh, rifle. There were technical terms, abbreviations, very funny ones, uh, sometimes designating very mundane things. So that was that world, which was in a way uh, ritualized. It was staged, very performative, very far away from ordinary, everyday, normal life. But it was a life itself. Here, that was a life. And that somehow lets us to think more seriously about the relationship between the form and the life and how they kind of um, position um, 
uh, towards each, each other. And to think about that, of course, we need to ask what these forms do, what did they do uh, when we speak about the forms about Yugoslav army, army service. First and foremost, they really served as a great equalizer. They provided a common ground for radically diverse men brought together to serve. So through these forms, all, all men, those who were very, very well educated at that moment, those who were illiterate, those who were Serbs and those who were Albanians, they all had to learn these forms and uh, use them in everyday life because that life was very prescribed. Uh, and that also gave them a common ground, not only to survive and not only to you know, effectively effectively act as a military unit that was in the interest of the army itself. But also this, this common ground enabled meaningful relations, relations of care, sorry, solidarity, friendship, love, love among people who were so different from each other that they would probably, as I already said, never meet each other. Um, so, these forms also served normalizing and in internalizing the life on the JNA basis, on the basis of the, on the basis of the Yugoslav army. This transition for ordinary life to army life was not easy one, especially for some men, and it was very important. Army had this strategy to really take care of that, especially in the first part of the military service, that was the army training that lasted for like sometimes three, sometimes six months, depending on the army branch, to really uh, put these, all, all these men into the drill, not to leave any free time to them. So they would not only, uh, that would not only prevent them being homesick, depressed, very unhappy because their girl uh, friends would have left them after a couple of months, uh, but also, um, that would enable them somehow internalize that reality, take it as normal, take it as life. And then within that life, that enabled mutual recognition and effects, as I said, and the ability of these men to see each other, recognize each other, befriend each other, not on the basis of characteristics that are usually in play when people uh, befriend, love, see, recognize each other, that's the language you speak, education you have, place you're coming, but on very different premises, mostly ethical premises. And most of these men would say it was important who is, who is a good man. And it was really irrelevant whether at home you have some expensive clothes or not, because these clothes are anyway, had to be sent home first day, first day of the army service uh, on the you know, army, military institution covered the expenses of sending the clothes by post back home. The only clothes they could have was a military uniform. So, and this is an important moment for me. And also um, that's actually something which uh, former Yugoslav soldiers point out as the most important aspect of that experience that despite all the you know, odds makes that experience meaningful. And um, of course, these forms were very restricted. They were reduced to some funny terms and using commons and the jargon. Uh, soldiers would defend themselves uh, using basically the same pool of uh, real, like objects, uh, formal names and so on. So it was restricted code. Uh, Speaking of it, it's, it's of course restricted in a different way than Bernstein speaks about restrictive codes. Uh, he links it explicitly to the class identity and restrictions come from being part of certain class. Here is basically the opposite. Here restriction comes from the fact that so many so different people, so different coming from so different classes need to interact, live together very intimately for a year or, or, or so. So this restricted, restrictedness really has a very, very different, um, different meaning and, and role. 
this language, this common ground, the uniform made the soldiers really the same. Uh, their moral characteristic came to the fore, their ethnic, educational, class characteristic went uh, somewhere to the background. And that's something which, uh, of course, counted back then and even more counted in the aftermath of Yugoslavia, uh, because in that aftermath, the ethnic frames became the only frames people could really exist, um, recognize each other, act politically, exist politically as well. I know it sounds quite, I will stop sharing for a while again. I know it sounds kind of very generalizing and maybe too you know, exaggerated, uh, but Bosnia is always a, a very good ex uh, example why it's not that. A couple of years ago, there was the, for the first time a protest in Bosnia that was not framed ethnically, that not, was not a pre, uh, protest of one ethnic group among other ethnic groups. That was a common protest. It was also um, called uh, baby, baby Lucian because it was uh, prompted by the fact that um, because of very specific dynamics of free entities in Bosnia where everything is ethnically framed, there was a procedural problem of issuing, um, you know, these uh, individual citizen numbers, like, num like numbers which makes you citizen, like makes you visible as a citizen. And uh, many babies born in that period did not get that number. Uh, they uh, consequently could not get any health insurance. And some of these babies badly needed treatment outside the country and could not get uh, passports and could not be treated outside Bosnia. So that really shows how this existing within ethnic frames really has very palpable consequences of people's lives. It's not just a floscule um, used by academics uh, in post-Yugoslav space right now. So, so in this, um, there the idea, or at least a possibility, a possibility to point to the possibility of being recognized outside ethnic frames uh, is something very important and something very politically, uh, politically relevant. I, I will very shortly just walk you through some photos from the Yugoslav army which illustrate what I'm trying to say now. So uh, I will skip this, we don't have that, that much time. But these are typical army photos. These are the old ones where people need to, you know, stand still for a long time so they need to lean on something. But mostly in the 70s and the 80s, the periods with, with which I uh, mostly deal in my book because that's the period most of my interlocutors serve the Yugoslav army. These are very classical, typical Yugos, uh, photos from the Yugoslav army. Young soldier, as long as he was allowed to go out to the city for the first time, would go and, and make this kind of photo. And these photos are very uh, typified, very, there is a minimal possibility of variation. One of the possibilities is lifting the collar as this guy did, that was considered cool, but not much, much more than that. What is really important for me about these photos, this is also again, uh, so they are staged in a way. They are like individual characteristics of these men are not really visible here. Of course, for their parents, their dear ones, the people who, who would get eventually these photos, they meant a lot and they were very unique and individual, but generally in this mess of these photos, um, individual, we, we cannot really say much about these men if we don't personally know them. We cannot say whether they are Serbs, Croats, Albanians, Muslims, Montenegrins, um, you know, Hungarians or belonging to any other ethnic group in former Yugoslavia. We cannot say whether they are very well educated or illiterate because most of men would do that even men who for whom this practice was not something very close would some sometimes go and take this photo because that simply was what soldiers do there was a ritualized aspect of this practice which then implied that um, 
deliberation was not a necessary component of doing this. Uh, so this putting individual characteristic into background is maybe the most present in these photos, which are called a uh, picture with memory. They would usually say like memory and long remembering memory from the GNA, Yugoslav National Army. Uh, so here, uh, Sometimes they would have this typical iconography of, of the Yugoslav military, Tito, weapons, um, different, like depending on the army branch, there would, would be planes, uh, ships, whatever, flags. And here even more the individuality is in the background while the frame is in the, like this ideological frame is um, brought to the fore. It was brought to the fore in the first photos as well, but it was uh, um, like materialized with the uniform. The uniform is in the fore. And the fact that you cannot really say much about these men, of course, produces anxiety in the post Yugoslav space, uh, where who you are, especially ethnically, really matters. And I have three photos of a Slovenian art photographer who served the army in the 86 in Belgrade. And um, in these photos, uh, they are, as you can see, very different from the photos I showed you just um, until the second ago. And these photos are very individualized, very remarkable. These men are really memorable in, in that sense. But of course, um, this was an artistic project, a project in which uh, this, although the photos are very individual, these men were not protected or, or, or of uh, being interpreted in a certain very singular way. In previous photos, we don't know who these men are, so we cannot say anything about them. We are aware that in this, uh, you know, abundance of these same photos, there is a huge difference, huge diversity. And here, uh, these photos are much closer to, um, to the genre of war photography, somehow anticipating what will happen very soon, but also anticipating something else. And that's th that people cannot really exist outside some ethnically defined frames. So these men are supposed here to illustrate, to embody, to represent three ethnic groups. This is an Albanian, this is, um, let me see, this is a Serb and this is a Roma man. Like, this is not, of course, something, uh, uh, we don't know whether these men are really uh, belonging to these three groups. It's not the point of these photos. These photos are actually pretty distorted. There is a, a, a Janne Strauss is the name of the photographer and Janne used a wide angle camera and you can see that this, like there is a certain deformation. Um, it's a very close uh, capture looking directly to the camera. And actually he said that these men um, never saw these photos and he was pretty sure if he, they would see them, they would never like, like them. They would not, never identify with them. So in that sense, that's something very different from the photos men would do going uh, to local studios when would they have free afternoon during their, uh, their service. But th that also anticipates what's coming because to exist as such, you need to um, um, yeah, we, you, uh, we need to um, be, be, you need to belong to certain ethnic group. You cannot be seen outside it. Someone was mentioning uh, also um, tattoos from the UNA and that's an absolutely very important uh, topic as well. Many of these tattoos were made, army officially did not allow for that, but of course, once the uh, tattoos would appear, no one would, had any problem with that. And most of uh, iconography of these tattoos are again, very, um, very predictable, expected, limited forms, the repertoire or of simply the letters J and A, dates of coming to the army and going back home. Um, 
again, very in form wise, that was a very, very limited repertoire, not, not very, uh, the army created itself, which again, of course, opens a lot of questions. Um, so I will try going slowly to the end because I'm aware the time is running and I want to leave some time for discussion. Uh, the, for me, the crucial question uh, and something I also put in the, the title of this talk is how these scar, scars forms, these forms through which the Yugoslav army service was lived, friendships were made, obviously experiences were made that still matter despite of everything, how these forms then relate to utopian imagination I want to talk about. And I see in uh, recollections of the army service by men I spoke uh, during actually many, many past years. Uh, army service is, itself was not an utopian space. It was rather a heterotopian space in uh, all possible ways. I already started with that saying that uh, exactly because uh, army wanted to provide essentially Yugoslav uh, experience of intimate life of very different people being together, it had to remove army service from the everyday. It was uh, very isolated, very detached from everyday life. Um, also to be able to make these men communicate to each other, army had to have one common language. And it was Serbo-Croatian for all the, all the time, uh, which was again against this idea about diversity, bringing diversity together. So to, to be able to make these people really recognize each other, make friends, do things together, there was, there, there had to be one language. Then again, army was, um, army service was, uh, universal, but that universality actually concerned only half of Yugoslav population. Women did not serve in the army, except from a very short period in, 80, uh, in between 83 and 85. Um, somehow that, that remained a male experience. Um, then, of course, I already spoke about this relationship between the routines, life, and mini meaningful relations. To, inter to internalize life in the army as, as life as such, that life ne needs to be fu uh, fulfilled with, with routines. And these routines, after performed enough times, would become internalized. There is, of course, a huge literature dealing with routines, with habits, and usually it speaks either about how in relation to institutions and uh, usually this literature speaks about how, how, the, uh, how the institutions actually uh, condition people exposed to them or belonging to them through routines. If these people repeat something uh, enough time, somehow then they become not sensitive, do not react uh, effectively emotionally uh, anymore to that they expect that. Uh, so that's a very typical interpretation of routines and the other typical interpretation coming, starting with, of course, Bourdieu, but also there, there are a lot of, there's a lot of work today is about kind of um, capacity of routines to change things, uh, to have this revolutionary uh, capacity to change maybe small things, but to change things. And a lot, you can see that like, uh, very often thinking about um, you know, uh, resistance, uh, making different kinds of communities, solidarities, people uh, resort to routines, creating routines or exploiting daily routines they, are, they already have. They find it as something very important. But here we again have this idea that uh, institutions or systems or sort of regimes or state are somehow on the other side from the citizens. There is a way of coping with them. And this is something I want to finish, uh, like I will use only a couple of minutes more. Uh, my question here is, are we able to imagine at all um, a life, a 
a political social life in which routines, forms, feelings would not be outside or opposed to the infrastructures of the state, but somehow in coherence to that. My question always was, I remember that uh, this is just also a disclaimer to make sure I, I by no means um, anyhow romanticize or propagate uh, military service because there are so many initiatives by uh, mainstream pol politics in these, these lands here, but also worldwide to reintroduce a, a mandatory military service. It was actually abandoned in all post-Yugoslav states and replaced with, um, with um, professional army. So it's not about military service, but there is something about the idea that citizens and the state can share infrastructures or the state can provide infrastructures for citizens and the state to act in coherence and mutual support and common interest. And we pretty much lost the idea something like this and is possible in post-Yugoslav space. And I'm sure in many other places and spaces in the world, world, the state is actually the biggest enemy of citizens today. Like citizens has to have to fight for, for basic essential resources like the clean air, the water, um, they have to fight privatization of, of these resources and so on. So that's really a very, very existential fight and struggle. And um, what, what is utopian or, or what's the utopian element to, towards which the people who remember Yugoslav army service and point to its meaningfulness, um, point to is actually the, like the political world in which there is an infrastructure provided for uh, effects, for imagination of, a, of common life, of collective life in which um, the state and citizens are not on the opposite, uh, on the opposite uh, side. I have here Jelena Zilnik description of the Yugoslav army where, where he really speaks about that in, in very overtly utopian terms, but I will skip it now. He actually says what I was saying too, that from, from the uh, present day perspective, you cannot really um, imagine these people unproblematically living together, so different people among themselves. And they not only live together and manage to kind of act coherently as a collective. There were effects of love, of care, of solidarity that emerged from this, the infrastructure of the Yugoslav army service, very elab elaborated, very complex infrastructure. That was also the state infrastructure in which uh, parents in a way believed to the state and were able and ready to send their kids for a year or so. In the 80s, this common trust disappeared and parents organized when it was clear that the war will start. They organized and tried to go to the barracks and save their kids to actually, you know, um, hijack them and bring them home. And many did that and many succeeded. And there were also in, like Serbian parents coming to Slovenia, Slovenian parents going to Croatia and so on. So that was the moment when it really disappeared. And uh, here I copied the text of the invitation the army was sending to uh, parents of young soldiers in the moment they would uh, give um, this oath. That was the moment maybe uh, after one month of service or a bit more and with uh, oath given, they would really become uh, Yugoslav soldiers. So parents and families were invited to be present uh, for the old giving ceremony. And if you read this invitation, you can see it's a very parental language used. And of course, we are all then prone to interpret that as, of course, so state socialism intervened uh, and intruded overtly into private sphere, tried to manage private life of people as well. But I don't think it's what is this about. It's more this really is about this common trust and having infrastructures in which different actors, citizens, the state, the army could 
act in coherence and in trusting each other. And that infrastructure was lost. So any introduction of um, military service today would in that sense, absolutely not bring together, bring back any utopian idea of being a citizen in, the, in different terms from those today. The willing or able to uh, you know, reinstate this infrastructure, not only because it's costly and it is costly, but also because it requires a very different political world, the world with, with, uh, which is not simply, uh, which is not imaginable within neoliberal liberal democracies we are all living uh, in today. I will stop here because I think I exceeded time I was given. So if you still have energy for conversation, I will be most happy. Thank you. We do have time because there's um, nothing after. So there have been a few comments in the chat and otherwise you can, um, anyone who has questions or comments, please feel free. Uh -huh. There is a question from Novi Sad. Uh, yes, it's more comment than a question. Is uh, as an Italian living in Serbia at the moment, I've been here for some three, three and a half years. Uh, I do perceive from many people some sort of a romanticized idea of when they serve the army. I know people who uh, still use those uh, abbreviations linked to the army. Uh, one year constantly is Gespe, so, you know, general cleanup, or I'm not sure how to translate exact, exactly. Uh, but there is still this perception, at least I, I feel it, I see it, of a romanticized idea of uh, of this service, at least uh, in Serbia. I don't know uh, if in other parts of former Yugoslavia there is a different feeling. Uh, so that was I what is what I would like to ask. Do you have an impression that in different parts of former Yugoslavia there is a different perception of this, or is some sort of homogeneous? Homogenous, sorry. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, I mean, of course, it's uh, it's it's not homogeneous, uh, but I would not say that the dividing lines would go through uh, ethnic ethnic boundaries or republic or state uh, state borders right now. I, I I was very careful over all over these over these years to really talk to uh, as diverse peop, uh, people as I could. So I spoke to practically everyone. There are differences. Uh, difference there, of course. I mean, it's also not to romanticize that everyone was happy to go to the army. No, most people were not happy to go to the army at all, and there were people who never really got used to that. Who to whom these routines and imposing these routines and drills did not make possible to internalize the like this idea of being now in this life of, of the Yugoslav soldier. And I spoke to such people uh, as well, but they were really a very small minority compared to people who in one way or another see something meaningful, important or good in that service. And uh, for many people, like, of course, we know that uh, depending also on time, for instance, in the 80s for Albanians was very bad and very difficult in the Yugoslav army. There was this incident in, I think it was 83, if I'm not wrong, in the city of Paracin. 
several uh, an Albanian soldier killed several several Yugoslav army soldiers and then killed himself. And that was also a moment of uh, intensifying conflicts and tensions between Serbia and Albanians in Kosovo. So they were very often treated as suspicious, given worse task, and very often really tortured, especially if they would have Serbian uh, officers as, as superiors. But even uh, these people um, would not dismiss that experience and something, even, even if traumatic, it was still important. It was important because of the friendship they made. And also, and I think it's very important as, uh, for, for the marginalized groups such as Roma, Albanians, uh, sometimes also, of course, Hungarians and others who did not really, they were people who did not speak Serbo-Croatian and for them there was, it was even more difficult to integrate into this new life. But for them, being Yugoslav army soldiers meant another kind of integration in the, into Yugoslav citizenship. They could not enjoy living in their local marginalized communities. And that's why they find it very important and stress it as very important. That was for them a way to belong as citizens uh, provided by the army and not provided in many other, uh, other places. So I would not say that um, I'm not able to establish a pattern and say, and say this kind of people, these ethnicities, these generations are more prone to see this experience positively than the others. Uh, I think it's really um, more dependent, depend, uh, dependent also on psychological uh, terms. Sometimes, of course, uh, one of the things I really try to, um, to um, deconstruct with this book and this, and this research is the idea that that is very current that, okay, that experience was important for uh, peasants and people from rural areas who never traveled, never met anyone else, never went to the big city. Uh, and of course it was important for them, but I can say for sure that it was equally important for people who were cosmopolitan, educated, edu ed educated who saw the world before they came uh, to the army. I have this I spoke with many artists like Zilnik, but also some Slovenian artists belonging to this Noja Slovenische Kunst collective, who of course were not the most happiest, the happiest to go to the army at the moment they had to go, but they all stress that this experience of diversity is amazingly valuable for them. Like that was also for them something they could not get in any other place. The same way as some, some you know, illiterate farmer would sometimes, um, for the first time, uh, li listen to some music uh, in the army or get camera and learn to use that or even learn to write and read. Uh, it was like, there was importance, maybe for different reasons, but definitely across ethnic or class, uh, class divisions. Um, yeah, I was, um, there is this, uh, of course, new media, social media provide new uh, avenues for reconnecting that were not, the, like possibilities that were not there maybe 30 years ago or immediately after the war. And for instance, there is a public group uh, on Facebook called find friends from the former Yugoslav people's army, Pronaji Drugove iz Bivše Jena. And currently there is there uh, 236,600 uh, members. So this is really amazingly huge membership. And it's interesting, like seeing what they do, like mostly they try to locate their friends very often, they visit them, they reunion with them. And um, I would say that's really like with the time passing, these reunions come uh, become easier. Sometimes they don't really contradict the logic of the aftermath in which who you are ethnically really matters. So some of them would say, 
okay, I'm a Serb, but this guy is a Croat, but we are friends from the army, we saw each other again. But actually, equally important for me were the, you know, the sentiments and the friendships that remain impossible. For instance, man who says, I had this army from, uh, this friend from the army. He was a great guy. He was from, I don't know, Southern Serbia. I think every day of him, I plan to call him, but that phone call will, nev will never happen. There are too, too many unknown, frightening things. Uh, like what happened with this guy, what he became, maybe he became a nationalist. Some, simply there were too many ruptures and people simply, this impossibility is something that somehow reminds us of, uh, of a different world and asset, unsettles this givenness of the structuring of the time in which what we have now is, was inevitable and uh, only, possible, uh, only possible solution. Uh, Vesna from Marieka. Uh, hi, yeah, I have just two comments. Uh, the first one, uh, uh, first of all, re really great talk. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, and uh, I have just two comments for uh, the first one is, um, so every time when I go to Serbia and I have friends and family there, so I go often, I always when people see the car, usually I get comments like, uh, Oh, we are from Rijeka. Oh, great. If it's not, I work there in a shipyard, then it's I served army there. If it's not Rijeka, it's Pula, which is near. So always it's the same story. And then they start uh, talking about some friends. Even they asked me like from which part of Rijeka you are. So maybe you know my friend from the army and so on. Uh, so really, I agree. I never thought about that like this until today. So, uh, but I really agree that for them it's. Uh, and the second comment is, I know a man for whom really uh, uh, going to the army was really a trauma. It's my high school teacher who told me once his experience and uh, in general, he's really, really anti-military and really sensitive person. So for him, uh, going to, the, to do the army service was really a huge, huge trauma. He, he told me that he thought that he was going to die because of that. And then he told me that he had a colleague there, uh, a poor Albanian peasant who didn't even know how to read properly and so on. So uh, my teacher would help him with letters. Uh, he would help him to read. And uh, the Albanian would do some military things for him. And he told me if it wasn't for, for him, I think that I would, I would be dead after that service because it really affected him uh, a lot. So, and he's 70 years old today. So this was like 50 years ago. And he's still talking about that. He told me that like a few years ago, we met for a coffee and it was really interesting. But as I said, I was never talking about the whole the ENA thing uh, like that until today. So it was really interesting for me hearing your talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wes. And that's, I mean, that's my story as well. I live in Ljubljana, I'm from Serbia. When I travel around, like people always say, oh, you are from Ljubljana. And uh, I think what you pointed out, this mutual care was really very important. And that it was the basis for these men to connect across really all possible social divisions that divided them. And many friends, like these were important friendships. And some of these friendships meant so much. We went through this rupture. I always speak about this. Um, uh, Haris Halilovic is a friend of mine uh, and he's an anthropologist living now in uh, Melbourne in Australia. He's from, uh, from Priedor in Bosnia. He served uh, in the 80s somewhere in Senta in Vojvodina. Mm -hmm. And there was Djurica from Rekovac near, uh, near Jagodina in central Serbia. That's actually the place more or less I'm coming from. And uh, Harris already finished uh, high school. He went to medicine high school because he, he worked in uh, like in inf infirmary on the military base. And Jurica was a peasant, barely literate, great accordion player, and terribly afraid of darkness. So each time Jurica would have to go on the night watch, Harris would put him into quarantine and say to the officers, oh, I suspect he has some chicken pox or whatever. 
so, and then in the afternoon, officers would come, uh, go home, and Juritsa would be released and saved from uh, being on the night watch. Then in the 90s, the war started, and uh, when it was clear that the war will happen, uh, uh, Juritsa's parents and Juritsa called Haritz and offered him to come to this very remote rural area in Serbia and stay with them and to be safe there. He did not do that. He, I mean, he had a very tragic story after that. He ended up actually in Ternopoli concentration camp because, because he went to, from Sarajevo to Priedor to visit her, uh, his uh, girlfriend. And as a Muslim, he was captured there and was, was in, in, in concentration, eventually managed to go to Zagreb and all the way uh, to Australia together with his brother. All other male members of Haris's family were killed in Srebrenica. And for him, this memory of Juritsa is kind of a stitch of humanity that still so much uh, makes sense of life here for him also after all these years. When I, I met Haris many years ago and then we met like, two years ago and I asked him about Juritsa and his face transformed. He said, you remember my Juritsa. And these two guys, they're friends of Facebook. They maybe congratulate birthdays to each other. They don't have much in common in life. They cannot have any profound connection anymore. But this Juritsa is really someone so important for Harris after everything that happened, some kind of light that gives sense to, to biography and, uh, and connects these two strands of his life that are disconnected so terribly by everything that happened in the 90s. So these stories, although they are very anecdotal and part of you know, a male everyday talk, they are profound and they are important and they really have this, um, this capacity to unsettle givenness of the present mm -hmm. in which we live. Yeah, I would say that uh, in Croatia today, after the war, uh, Yugoslavian, uh, Yugoslav army has uh, at the level of institution has uh, just negative connotations. But I would say that every man that was in that army has some personal story which has nothing to do with uh, the point of view that everyone has today of this army as an institution. Absolutely, yes. I mean, um, in Croatia, of course, and here in Slovenia as well, uh, the events of the 90s where that army was not an, at all anymore the same army, in fact. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is somehow generalized as the story about the Yugoslav army in general. At that moment, that army was something else totally aligned with very nationalist uh, Serbian politics. Uh, it was an aggressor army, but still there are, uh, like here in Slovenia, two years ago, the citizens were congratulated by a big billboard, by big billboards on which was a young uh, Yugoslav army soldiers in uniform surrendering to territorial defense. And many people reacted like this is absolutely wrong. That's not what it, that army was because simply they served in that army as well. And many young men served until the last moment. Actually, there was a great, um, great comic book um, graphic novel called Vojna, the war, the name is in Slovenian by Goran Duplančić. I, I just wanted to ask you about that. Uh... That's a great, I totally, because that really yeah. then, that, that, that comic book tells the story about these, these young men who actually were the last to defend the country. Everyone else gave up much before. And then, uh, yeah. But not to reduce this um, uh, story only to Yugoslav exceptionalism. Uh, I, I really think, of course, there were so many, um, so many parallels to the Soviet army, to many other uh, mandatory armies across the world actually. But what is really uh, important here to uh, have in mind is this really inclusive and radically uh, egalitarian principle Yugoslav army really struggled to inform. So it was never per perfect, but there was this idea that all these men have to be mixed and equal in spite of the dramatic differences uh, they, that characterize them. And At the same time in Bulgaria, for instance, yeah, Bulgaria had an army 
which uh, in which Muslims, so members of the po Pomak minority, Turks, other Muslims, Roma, did not serve in regular units. They were they served in special units called construction units, and essentially they never get, got any access to weapons. They were only digging, you know, trenches or whatever. So there was a clear, uh, clear divide in terms of citizenship, uh, which in Yugoslavia was something totally unthinkable. Um, and I assume you also read Goran Vojnovic. Uh, his novel also starts with the Serbian in Pula uh, base uh, uh, of the army, and then the war begins. So really, this was like emblematic point. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, I think it's almost nine. So uh, it, are there any other questions or? I think there's one more. Let's have one last question from Olga Doni. Uh -huh. Yeah, hi, thank you for of the talk. Of course, hi. Uh, hi. Yeah, thank you for the talk. I have a just um, um, a question, maybe a bit more generalized. Okay. So um, after researching this topic, uh, have you come up with any idea of what can replace this kind of practice or institution? I mean, you talked about army, right? And this positive uh, kind of uh, influence on the people. But maybe have you heard of anything in some other countries or have you considered any other practice of what can bring this positive influence, but at the same time, not be that militaristic, you know, or m maybe a bit mm -hmm. more humanistic or something. So any ideas of, because it, it looks like kind of initiation, right? So when you can experience different uh, practices, different contexts, different people, etc. But um, and we understand that on the one hand, a state uh, sees it as a beneficial practice, because of yeah all, all the benefits that the state can get, uh, but at, at, at the same time maybe it's a bit it's really special for people because it's life threatening right and that's why maybe it cannot be replaced because you also mentioned it today right when people had this life threatening experience they of course uh, remember it better but maybe there is something that can gather people together in some practice but not but you know be a bit kinder maybe <laughs> thank you for okay. Thank you. Um, you know, the sound was not the best. I was losing you from time to time, but I think I got what you are asking. And of course, that's that's absolutely important question. Uh, as I said, I was not. I remember when I was a teenager, and uh, all my cousins, a bit older than myself, were going to the army. I was. A, I'm coming from a village uh, in Serbia, and. At that moment, going to the army was celebrated in a very similar way as the wedding. So it was a big celebration with music. And, but I remember that I was puzzled and amazed with the fact that there is someone who can order you to leave everything you have and do and go somewhere for, for one year. For me, it was in, in unthinkable in that moment it is unthinkable to me today as well. Equally unthinkable as, of course, uh, any, like, I'm very aware, and I, I, I always very much felt, and in former Yugoslavia, we had no other choice but to feel it, how thin the line between these rituals and uh, opening the space for equality within the military, and then the military conflict is. And think of what is going on in Ukraine now, like, I, we all are faced with this uh, kind of um, question, how it is possible when I think, how it is possible that we live in a world in which uh, all men need to stay somewhere and there is their life and women are free to go somewhere. Okay, there is a necessity, but how we come to the state in which that's a necessity. So, so, so I totally feel what you are asking me. I don't have an exact question, but what I'm trying to say actually with my book is that it's not about ARM itself. It's, uh, it's about providing an infrastructure, an infrastructure in which essentially will allow different people to be together and be able to recognize each other beyond 
identitarian uh, categories in which they are somehow placed uh, more or less automatically. And socialism in Yugoslavia was very good in providing that kind of infrastructures. Uh, the army is by many seen as the opposite of self-management. Of course, it was the opposite of self-management. It was mandatory. It was totally prescribed. There was no idea of that. You decide what to do. It was essentially the opposite, but at the same time, it enabled, it relied on the very, uh, uh, you know, uh, comparable um, infrastructures as self-management. And that is to provide people with space, with infrastructure in which they can uh, form collectivities outside, uh, you know, um, predefined social categories. Uh, one of such uh, infrastructures pr was provided by the concept of amateurism, for instance. So you would have these, uh, I started with these communal uh, centers in the countryside, but also it were, these were student cultural centers where people would simply have possibilities to do things. So there was, uh, Photo amateur photo clubs, clubs in socialist Yugoslavia were essential, especially in the 70s, because that was the only place you can you could get a photo camera. And many young people learned to take photos, and that became their profession. But without this state infrastructure that enabled it, that would probably not happen. And the army also uh, did that. That, that. It enabled a young illiterate peasant to, come, to go to the first concert in his life or to see James Bond movie for the first time or to write a song for the you know, unit uh, wallpaper uh, for the first and the only time in his life. So it's about infrastructures, I would say. And these infrastructures should be somehow shared by different stakeholders. It, uh, the problem with our imagining alternatives and the future for that matter today is that we are able to think about them uh, exclusively uh, in opposition to the system and outside the system. And at the same time, we just went through pandemic and still are going on and will go for some time for sure. There we could feel how badly we need a functioning system at the first place. Uh, so this idea of uh, uh, authentic resistance being or, or acting or alternatives or coalitions being possible exclusively outside uh, the infrastructures provided by some system is problematic uh, and it really marks uh, and our, our political realities and disables us as political subjects. We actually need the possibility to think of infrastructures in different ways. That's, that's my, I don't know whether I answered your question, but I think it's important creating spaces uh, which uh, will enable people uh, be together and recognize each other outside purely identitarian um, categories within which usually we make our struggles today. Thank you. Yeah. Then it's a question, yes, for what um, can a state find beneficial to build such an infrastructure, right? So like the, the next step, so what can make a state to do it? So yeah, but yeah, thank you for, for your answer. Yeah, I mean, the, the state, uh, it's, it's difficult because um, we lost that idea of the state with the end of state socialism. And uh, we don't see that kind of state authentic anymore. Think about Cuba, for instance, right now, or other places which differ from the ideas of liberal dem democracies around the world. When we speak about Cuba, most of people say, I need to go there before everything collapses. And that's people repeat, that was, is what people repeat for the last 50 years. Because we can somehow cannot imagine that it will not collapse. It must collapse because it's so different from what we are imagining as a proper state and proper citizens. Uh, imagine the idea, like I, I was teaching about that uh, maybe last time or two times, uh, this huge humanitarian project 
uh, Cubans had uh, from the 1990 to 2005, when they actually treated 26,000 of children from Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine after Chernobyl disaster. And it was happening at the moment, Cuba was in the worst possible situation ever in the 90s, special period. And you cannot find almost anything about that in Western media. I found one uh, article in New York Times in which some expert for Cuba says, yeah, they are insisting on this project after all these years because uh, abandoning that would be a bad PR. So we can think about it only in terms of interests, PR, and not about essential moral, uh, you know, imperatives of helping if the help is needing, needed. The same was with Cuban doctors now during uh, the pandemic, Cuban doctors appearing in Italy and uh, having in their hands Castro's photo and uh, and uh, Cuban Cuban flags and the only like the most typical reaction was yes they are just propagating uh, spreading their propaganda and uh, propagating their socialism or or hoping that they will get something in return. We coming from uh, former Yugoslavia, we very well know also how. Um, the idea of humanitarianism is such transformed more or less uh, during the Yugoslav wars. It was not anymore, and it is not definitely anymore, something that is based on moral principles of necessity and moral imperative. It's the business, it's uh, something people do for their biographies, or it's charity, but it's not seen as uh, anymore as something which uh, should define our international uh, like arena. It's privatized after all. Yeah. So these are changes actually we uh, somehow acquired to together with the end of socialism and uh, placing all our hopes in um, liberal democracy as the only possible way to politically exist. Yeah, there is a great book of, uh, of a very different socialism and if it's aftermath uh, written by um, David Scott called Omens of Adversity, where he speaks about the small Caribbean island of Grenada and its short-lived socialist project between 69 and 83 and everything that happened after all, but that's a very, very relevant story and much broader one for all of us, especially for people from post-socialist world, because it so uh, poignantly shows how, um, how actually the end of Cold War was also the end of alternatives. And we are basically now struggling with the absence of alternatives at the first place. Yes, the book is the, uh, yes, the Omens of Adversity and David Scott is the, the author. Double T. Thank you. Thanks, Tanya. Um, I think we'll stop the recording now.